with President Trump. And President Trump was at the fight in Vegas the other night. The crowd went wild when he got there, walked in. I see that uh, Mel Gibson gave him a salute. Uh, these are his people. And uh, Dana White is his kind of guy. Dana White, head of the UFC, and President Trump, good friends. Here they are getting off of Air Force One together. Dana White, uh, congratulations on a hugely successful event and uh, everything else. Welcome to Newsmax. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. So real quick, I just want to get the fight out of the way. Uh, yeah, look, I'm kind of glad McGregor went down. I know that was painful. I think he was asking for it. Um, does he play the bad guy on purpose? What's that all about? Uh, you know, <clears throat> the, the first time they fought, he came in and won by knockout. The second fight, um, in, you know, everybody felt like he was overlooking Poirier. It was very nice to him. And, you know, I uh, was talking about donating to his charity and things like that. And I, I don't know what, you know, went off in Connor's head that his mindset needed to be different in this third fight. But, yeah, he came into this one pretty nasty. Well, again, it was huge, uh, great attendance. It did uh, amazing on, on pay-per-view. And, hey, UFC, you guys were on the forefront of getting back to normal, getting back to sports, getting back to life um, in the middle of COVID. And I thought that was, it was like a, a hope. It was a signal of hope for so many people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, thanks. You know, uh, sitting home and hiding uh, never made sense to me. I, I I couldn't wrap my head around that. We're Americans. This is America. We get out there and we, we you know, we, we face challenges. We, we find solutions and we figure things out. And uh, that that was my mentality going into this this whole COVID thing. I was willing to spend whatever it was going to cost. I was going to set up my own lab here uh, for testing. And uh, you know, we we eventually ended up doing that. We ended up creating uh, what I think was the first bubble. Uh, you know, and, and we, we, we put on an event in Florida, uh, down in Jacksonville. Then, then we went out to Abu Dhabi and created the best bubble in all of sports or anywhere else. Yeah, that was a huge uh, accomplishment. Uh, I read about it in The New Yorker, of all places. They did quite a profile on that event. Hey, uh, you know, a lot of people see you. Hey, he's the, you're at the top of the world. Uh, you know, you're rich, you're famous, you're very successful. Uh, they don't see all the hard work you put into this. Can you tell us a story about how you came to UFC, how you came at the, the very early stages and what you had to do to make this happen? Yeah, so me and my partners, the Fertitta brothers, they own station casinos uh, here in Las Vegas. We, we, we fell in love with the sport of mixed martial arts and ended up buying the UFC for $2 million back in 2001. Uh, we, we, you know, we started to uh, work to get it regulated by the athletic commissions, uh, in this country, and by the time we got to like 2004 or five, we were like 30 million dollars in the hole, and we ended up doing a reality show called The Ultimate Fighter that turned everything around for us, got us on free television, and then uh, you know started to uh, grow our pay per views. And over the last, <clears throat> by 2016, we sold the company for four billion dollars uh, to to WME IMG Endeavor, and I stayed on board. Um, and we just uh, we just went public here a couple months ago. Congratulations. That is uh, that's pretty amazing. Hey, you know, I have a theory uh, about your uh, you and President Trump. You get along very well. You're both very authentic. That's how it strikes me. You see that in him. He sees that in you. Um, you get him and he gets you. Do I got it right? Yeah. You know, we've been friends for over 20 years and when we first bought the UFC, we started calling around looking for venues, and no venues wanted us at that time. Uh, Trump saw the, you know, whatever he saw in this, uh, in this sport, and he said, "Come to the Trump Taj Mahal. We'd love to have you here." And when you think about it, Trump brand was here, UFC brand was down here. Not only did he cut us a good deal, and do we not, do we do the fight there? He showed up for the first fight of the night and stayed all night and was there till the main event. Anything good that's ever happened to me in my career, he was the first guy to pick up the phone and call and say, congratulations, I knew you guys were gonna do this. The guy's never been anything but amazing to me and uh, I consider him a good friend. So what happens next? It's like you've done it all. I mean, you know, like, what do you do? Have MMA on the moon, uh, on Mars? I mean, what do you, what's the next level for you? 
yeah, we're going to continue to take this into countries uh, that we've never been. For instance, we have three uh, African-born world champions right now in the UFC. So we're going to do a fight over in Africa. You know, I'm probably going to build a, a, a performance institute over in Africa. We're going to continue to grow our fan base, and you know, all over the world. Listen, the, 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 the one thing, if you look at the NFL and how powerful it is here in the United States, these guys have been trying to go uh, global for a long time, but it just doesn't work. You know, um, you know, people aren't going to be invested in Germany and, you know, the, the, the New York Giants or whatever it might be. They didn't grow up playing it. They're not invested in the team. But fighting, fighting works everywhere. I don't care what color you are, what country you come from, or what language you speak. Fighting's in our DNA. We get it. We like it. Hey, what is the hardest part of your job? Um, the hardest part of my job, well, these days is probably traveling, traveling so much. Um, but the other thing is, you know, we're trying to build this thing uh, on a global level. The problem is there's not enough time in the day. Um, so time, I would say, is my biggest problem. All right. Now, listen, I don't want to put you on the spot. You, why was Poirier's wife texting or, or attempting to text McGregor on Instagram. Any insight? Have you heard anything? What's the word? So there was a... I, I haven't heard, but what I would assume it was is there was a huge beef between both camps over the, uh, the donation to Poirier's charity. And I'm sure the wife was reaching out about the donation for the charity. That's one theory. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I, I assure you. All right. That's why she was reaching hey, out to him. Poor, you know, McGregor was uh, flying, uh, saying all kinds of, uh, wow. But that's McGregor for you. Look, he's a showman. 100%. And we appreciate, uh, we appreciate the show. Well, we appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, final thoughts, sir. Thanks for having me. That oh, was a great weekend. And, uh, and, and uh, we got a great year laid out, and, and I'm excited for the rest of this year. I'm, I'm excited that everything is back to normal. You know, pe people are getting back to work. Sports are, are, are having fans again. It's time to get this country back up on its feet and back to work. Awesome. Dana White, hey, last thing, I'm sorry. Have you ever thought about running for politics? No way in hell. <laughs> Well, never. you never say never, but that's pretty much never. Never, ever. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dana White, Thank appreciate you. it. All the best, and we'll be right back. Hey, I'm Rob Finnerty. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please join the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, too. Hit the bell icon to be alerted to breaking news. And remember, there's a whole lot more on Newsmax TV, America's fastest-growing cable news network. Newsmax TV, where real news for real people.